The Utah Jazz blew it up last week by trading Donovan Mitchell to the Cleveland Cavaliers after trading Rudy Gobert to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Their future now is all about the draft picks. Luckily, we're locked on NBA Big Board, and we're going to break down not only what those draft picks are, but what their approach should be, what their future is, and what to look forward to this year. We'll also do some fun games at the end of this. Coming up on Locked On NBA Big Board. You are Locked On NBA Big Board, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, thanks for making Locked On NBA Big Board. You're the first listen of this Thursday. My name is Richard Stamen. You probably know me better as at Mavstraft on Twitter. Again, I, uh, I talked about it in the cold open. We're going to be talking about the Utah Jazz. There's nobody better to be talking Utah Jazz with on this network outside of David Locke than the one and only Leaf to lean. And Leaf gives David a run for his money. No offense, <laughs> David. <laughs> uh, all fun, but I know you guys kind of work together, so it's fine. But uh, Leaf is here to talk Utah Jazz. We're going to talk about the future. Today is just entirely about the future of the Utah Jazz. Leaf, what you got for us? I'm excited to talk about the Jazz, and it's certainly an interesting time for Jazz Nation. We, you know, you got to embrace the rebuild now. But you and I are going to break down what it, the the immediate future has entail, and then what the down the road future, which is what the Jazz fans, including myself. Uh, are looking forward to and and what that whole process looks like for Danny Ainge and company. Yeah. And let's just, let's dive into it. We'll start chronologically. I think we can start with the now the next year and then the long term, And then just again, we'll we'll run this with some games, but um, so this year they're obviously, I mean, stop me if I'm wrong here. I think they're tanking. I think the tank fest is already getting crowded. We saw San Antonio blow it up. Utah now has, I think it indicates that every GM believes this is a very strong class. What do you see Utah doing this year in terms of, are they going to go all out tanking? Or are they just going to kind of coast and see where the roster takes them? Something in between. What do you foresee in that? I, I personally think that you see some of the veteran stalwarts that have been on these contending jazz teams move before the season. And some of them are on the team, but play minor roles. So, the veterans that I speak of are Bojan Bogdanovic, Mike Conley, Jordan Clarkson. I think one or two of them's traded before the season, before training camp. Maybe one of them's kind of held on to a la Al Horford, and then you try to get a good package from a contending team that needs a, if it were to be Conley, that needs a heady point guard that could play six-man minutes as he's a little past his prime and could be a starter if you needed him to be. Um, you, if it were if it were to be Clarkson, and Clarkson stayed and he played, he, he could score 20, 25 a game on this team. Um, could Malik Beasley, a guy the Jazz newly acquired, I kind of think they keep him because, he, you know, you, you keep the new toys a little younger. You could see his development, whereas all the, those other players kind of have, have their niche in the NBA. Um, but I do I do believe that the Jazz are going to trade some of their veterans. They're going to make a few more deals because I think they have too many, too many players for training camp. I think they have 17 players right now that would be under roster. They've got young talent that we haven't seen in jazz uniforms, such as Taylor Horton Tucker. Um, and then you, and then you see, what about Ochag Baji? What, how much does he play? How much does Colin Sexton, Laurie Markin, how much do they play into winning? Can they win? And I, and, and do you want to win is the question. I don't think so. You want to develop the players that you want to be part of your prime. Once you get those draft picks as the centerpiece of your franchise. And, and the question remains who will be on that team in three years rather than who's on the team immediately. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think ultimately they're going to hold some guys out as the season gets closer and closer to ending. I think March you're going to see them pull some tactics that uh, other teams like the one I'm wearing um, on my shirt have done in the past where they just say, oh, whoops, you like you, you hit your toe on the coffee table. You're probably out the rest of the season. It's pretty rough. Uh, but they may, they may tank them out. But uh, I think you bring up a good point, though. They have they do have good pieces. I mean, you look at Colin Sexton, Lowry Markinen, uh, Malik Beasley, I think. I think all three of those guys are pretty good. They took some gambles on other guys, such as like uh, Taylor Horton Tucker. I really like that gamble. They can now develop Jared Butler and Leandro Bolmaro. Um, obviously, they got Walker Kessler in a trade. Jared Vanderbilt. They have a lot of good rotation upside pieces. So, and this is a team that has drafted well, no matter where they pick. I mean, for the most part, I mean, they got Rudy Gobert. What it was it twenty seven? I know that's what he wears. So maybe, yeah. I mean, they're they're good at finding talent. They got Donovan Mitchell at the very end of the lottery by trading up. This is a team I'd feel confident 
in doing that for. So um, I guess for this year, who is somebody that you would think, like obviously their best player right now is Mike Conley. I wouldn't really factor him in. Let's just say one of the young guys. Who do you think ends up being the best player on the team that's not an older player if they do stick? I, I would guess it's Colin Sexton. And, but I will throw a flyer if 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 Clarkson stays. But if I, if we're excluding him, it's the, the lead score is going to be Colin Sexton or Malik Beasley. I would lean with Sexton. And this is a take I think we talked about beforehand, but I think a lot of fans will will appreciate this. Colin Sexton puts up a lot of numbers. He scored 24 points a game before his injury. Um, though I think the reason he was excluded from the the core of the Cavaliers, what they were building, and, and why this is so appealing for Donovan Mitchell to go and join a team with three all, all-star all caliber players already that are under 25 years old, um, it, and that's why he was excluded, is that he's an inefficient player. He's a very good player, but he's not necessarily a winning player in the role of a starter. If he were to be a sixth man, he'd be excellent. But the the thing that is appealing about his contract, he, he signed a – four-year, $72 million deal, which is 18 per year, which is a pretty team-friendly contract considering his talent. But it's like you don't want to do that if you're trying to contend because that's too much money to put in someone that doesn't help you win. But the Jazz aren't trying to win, so that's a great deal because then he can develop, become better, and be potentially a part of a franchise that wants to win once they find their centerpiece. And with the amount of Jazz draft picks they have both in the next upcoming draft, which we mentioned is a studded draft, star-studded draft, and in the future, the Jazz really have those pieces. So this is a big year for Sexton to develop his scoring, to develop his arsenal. I think Jared Vanderbilt's going to be a long-term piece. I really like his versatility and rebounding. I, I believe that Markinen will probably not be a piece in that. And then I, I think that Ochag Baji will be a piece as well. And I'm curious to see as later in the year how well he develops because I think the more the later into the year, the more you play a rookie because he's not going to be that integral to winning. And it is integral to your development as a team for when you want to win. Yeah. And I mean, I agree about Sexton. He's probably going to be the best player on the team, uh, at least statistically in terms of volume. I'm interested to see though, what plays out in that guard rotation, because they have a lot of mouths to feed now uh, because you have Colin Sexton in theory, you have Mike Conley. I don't, and Jordan Clarkson, if that stays, you have Taylor Horton Tucker, you have Nikhil Alexander Walker, you have Bomaro, you have Jared Butler. That's a lot of development to go around. I mean, excluding even just take out Conley and Clarkson, that's still four guys right there. Um, and then obviously Malik Beasley's a two more than a, I think more than a three at least, but you can probably play him up in the three. Uh, so that's a lot of guard minutes to go around too. So for me, if like my my take for the Jazz is they obviously punt winning. That's not relevant this year. It's a great class, totally fine to lose out. But ultimately, if you're not at the least – finding guys that can stick, find somebody that can gain trade value. Um, I think, you know, Markinen is a prime example of that. Cleveland almost did that. They took him purely out of value. He was a terrible fit in a way. I mean, they ran three power forwards slash centers in lineups at times, and they still made him work. So they clearly rebuilt his value, rebuild some value. I mean, if I was them, I would be trading for some bad contracts or something uh, with a young player attached or the likes. Somebody, maybe even a reclamation project. I really like the idea for them at the least, if they're not developing in their own talent for the long term, they can at least develop something that'll turn into long term talent. I wouldn't be surprised if Markin is dealt as soon as the trade deadline. I think he could use this time and be a 20 point a game score, make himself very valuable. A team says, hey, you know what? I think we could use a shooter. Like, for instance, this is this is not a one to one comparison, but they, they are similar. The Celtics were really thrilled about the idea of getting Danilo Gallinari. Well, who's better than Gallinari, doesn't have a torn ACL and is younger? That's Laurie Markkinen. Could they possibly be interested? Or could another team that wants size and shooting, and, and Markkinen's not a good defender, but he, he was playing the three. Now if you play him on a four, he's more serviceable. I don't think a team necessarily is going to give you the like give you the farm for Laurie Markkinen, but uh, he could be a value, valuable asset if he's shooting 38% from three and he's seven feet tall and plays the power forward and you could be your sixth man. Like, I think, I think there's a very conceivable way that Malik Beasley and Lowry Markin are not part of the long-term future, but help the long-term future with their performances this year. Exactly. I mean, would it shock you if Lowry Markin and just spitballing here went night, had 19 points a game, nine rebounds, an assist and a half on 
shooting splits of 43% from the field, 36% from three and 87% from the line. Like that doesn't sound far fetched, right? No, I, I, think, I think it's game. very plausible. And, and yeah. I also, I also think that a guy like Will Hardy, new head coach is going to yeah. want guys like that to ha- who have valuable experience on good teams. And the Cavaliers weren't great last year, but they were good. They were <laughs> contending for a long while, ran into a bit of injury trouble with Jared Allen getting hurt and marketing had to step up and play in, uh, a role that he's not necessarily native to. And now he's going to get a role more tailor-made for him. I think he could score 20 routinely and be about what you said, 19, 8, you know, so, something like that. And I, I think that's not far-fetched as, at all. Yeah, that was that was his second year in the league stats in Chicago. Granted, he only played 52 games. I think it's entirely feasible. So uh, I really like that. We'll also be talking about some of the, um, you know, NBA draft outlook, what they can look forward to as a prize for this year. But – uh, first, let me tell you about another prize actually called Built Bar. If you haven't tried Built Bar Puffs yet, you are depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor. Are you ready? It's delicious, indulgent cookie dough covered in chocolate. That's right. Built has done it again. Let me introduce you to your new favorite, Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs. They have a light and chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks. And of course, they are covered in 100% real chocolate. All of the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it, plus it's healthy for you. Cookie dough chunk puffs are only 160 calories and they have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them. So if you run to built.com right now, go snag a box for you and the family. It'll be the perfect treat or just for yourself, whichever it is. Like all built bars, the new cookie dough chunk puff is covered in 100% real chocolate. That means they are healthy and tasty. Chocolate cookie dough covered with a light fluffy texture. It is so good. What's great about Built is all their Built Bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. You eat something that tastes good and is good for you. So you're going to love these cookie dough chunk puffs. Whether you need a snack for your workout, that's what I use them for. Uh, personally, going to be taking that here an hour or so. A uh, late night treat if, you gotta, if you're always hungry, kind of like I am also, or you just need a quick bite. Built is the perfect protein bar and they taste better than a candy bar. So ditch the calories, fat, and sugar. Grab yourself a built bar. If you go to built.com, use promo code locked on 15 and get 15% off your order. Use promo code locked on 15. So we are locked on NBA Big Board. Uh, I'm joined by Leif Tulin, um, one of the, he works with the Jazz uh, in Utah Sports. Also, is a massive college basketball just expert, I would say. And because of that, we're going to combine those two worlds. And what we're doing here is we're going to be talking about what we can look forward to in this draft. And then kind of just a little bit, uh, I'll give some insight into the couple other drafts that the Jazz have picks in. And so for those that don't know, the Jazz have 14 incoming first round picks. They have six of their own seven. They have three unprotected from Minnesota in all of the odd years until 2027. So 23, 25, 27. Kind of the same thing with the Cavs. Their start in 25, but 25, 27, 29. Then they have a top five protected pick from Minnesota in 2029. And then in this year, they get the least favorable of Brooklyn, Houston, or Philadelphia. Uh, So that's probably just going to be a pick in the 20s. They're not going to get that Houston one because they're not going to be better than Brooklyn or Philly. Uh, I would expect Utah to be on Philly watch a lot this year. And then they also have swap rights in with Minnesota or Cleveland in 2026 and with Cleveland in 2028. So they have a lot their only outgoing first round pick is a top 10 protected pick next year in 2024. So not this upcoming draft, but the one after. And that's at this point, I would be shocked if that conveys. And then it goes to top 10 in 2025, top eight, 2026. And then if it's not conveyed, it's a 2028 second round pick to Oklahoma city. So Leaf, I'm curious what you think, what should the jazz approach be in drafting? Should it just be best available? Should they go by, Hey, this was a struggle for us. If they say win 25 games, 26 27 something like that where it's not all doom and gloom but it's still rough what do you think they should do uh at the top do you think they should cater to what they have in place or go with just talent and make the fit later yeah i I firmly believe in best player available when when kind of having the cupboard cupboard barren um like there there are times where you would take a player that is a fit if you're a top five pick but you have the talent already. And the good example of that is the Warriors took a shot in James Wiseman, but he wasn't going to play initially. Jonathan Kuminga, same idea. You take a shot on talent and, you know, he fits your, your fits your timeline in the long term and could potentially help you in the short run. Um, the Jazz are not in that same situation. They have a barren, uh, a barren cupboard. And I think you go best player available. Obviously, the, all the talks, Victor Wimbanyama, Scoot Henderson, 
Um, if they're if the Jazz end up with a top two, top three pick, that's phenomenal. And you get one of those guys that's that should change your franchise and really accelerate your timeline. If they get five through ten, this is one of the best drafts to have a five through ten pick, and you still could have a franchise altering talent. So I say best player available. Danny Ainge had like kind of has a type. Um, like guys that fit that type, G.G. Jackson, Cam Whitmore, Derek Whitehead, guys that really are heady but really athletic players that you think could develop into more. Um, and, and I think there's plenty of those type of guys. The, the question is now you get two probably 20, 20 to 25 in one and 25 to 30 in the other. And the question is how much can you impact your team with those type of picks? And that's where I feel like the, the, um, the tank gets accelerated into, hey, we can build something because – likely we don't convey or the, the jazz won't convey the 2024 and then you get another top 10 pick because it's top 10 protected and now you have four players that you really hope to accelerate your franchise and not to mention a guy who went in the lottery this past year on your franchise that they acquired from the cavaliers and ochag baji and now you have five players that you really hope to change your franchise's trajectory so that's kind of my theory obviously it's easier said than done and it's we don't know who's playing well we don't know what pick we're going to have but you take best player available early and then maybe fits an upside on one of the, the two and then the opposite on the other of the late round first round picks in the 2023 draft. Yeah, I, I think I agree, especially in year one of a rebuild. I mean, this was my stance with Orlando in 2021. I, I didn't care about who was taken at four, what position it was. It wasn't like, hey, they need to get like a guard. They need to get a wing. They need to get a center. It didn't matter. They also had the eighth pick, so it also eased the blow if they missed. Um, but when you're in that first real draft, like that first year of that rebuild, and even this year actually with Orlando, like I, I think you just got to swing for talent. Like when you're bad, talent's usually the reason why. Not be You're not the worst team in the league or floating with the worst team in the league because you didn't have good fits. It's because you didn't have talent. So I think ultimately that makes for strong building blocks, especially in this class. And then you touched on it. The end of the, I think the end of the first round is going to have some really good value. I think you see that in a lot of these stacked classes. The end of the first round has guys slip to the end of the first that have no business slipping that far. And because of that, they end up good as to nobody's surprise. So give me some of your wish list of obviously Scoot and Wimanyama. We've talked about them ad nauseum already, and it's still almost a year to the draft. So beyond those two, give me like a short list of early favorites that you want to see, like just favorites of yours, not necessarily most likely, but who you want to see at the top of the draft for Utah. Say they get like the third pick. <laughs> I, I think the Thompson twins would, would be really appealing. I, I honestly couldn't tell you which one I feel like is better yet because there's been kind of limited game film on them. Um, I think the dynamic athleticism and size there is really where I would start if you don't get one, uh, Scoot or Wenbenyama. Um, so I would choose one of the Thompson twins as my franchise starter and you get ball skills, you get freak athleticism. And I think it's easier to develop a shot than it is to develop athleticism. So um, that's where I'd start. I mentioned it a couple minutes ago that Cam Whitmore, GG Jackson are kind of guys that I feel like Ainge would salivate over. Derek Whitehead's got kind of got that similar ability as well. I just hope he recovers well from his foot injury prior to the Duke season and doesn't suffer like injury rows such as that AJ Griffin suffered. And I think they, they Derek's on a higher trajectory. I think he's a better regarded prospect than AJ was, but I, I worry from that point of view. Um, I, I think a wish list I'd have later in the draft though, it is uh, Jordan Walsh. If he were to slip to, you know, 20 to 25, I'd really like that type of pick and a kind of a, energizer player i've compared him to a mix of dalen terry and scotty barnes i, I really li I like jordan walsh i think uh chris murray could be there could be an, a little bit older kind of be a good player right away um there, there are a number of players later in this draft i think could be really good and you, you obviously hope maybe maybe one of those teams isn't as good as we think and and like the timberwolves have an injury or something and they still have a young core. So they're very dependent on those couple stars they have. Maybe they're not that good and you get another good pick and you, and you get a pick in the teens. And, and so there is a way to accelerate the timeline, but the jazz fans have to be patient. And, but this is a great draft to have three picks in. And I think that was extremely intentional from the front office, not happenstance. Yeah, I agree. And for me, I mean, I, I, I agree with the Thompson twins would be good. Cam Whitmore would be really good. My pick uh, I'm, probably a little bit too high on this guy, but currently he is my number three player. Uh, I would love to see them land Derek Lively, not necessarily at the third pick, but 
I would love to see them develop another center that um, has just great presence around the rim, kind of raw, but has the physical tools, but also like lively can shoot. So I really like his game. I think he'd develop well in Utah. And I think it's really important to touch on this. Uh, you know, Utah, again, like I said it earlier, Utah has a track record of hitting no matter where they pick. This is a team where they have good talent evaluation and they can find guys at the end of the first round, middle of the second, does not matter. They have good talent evaluation. I trust them. Yes, they have picked like some guys like uh, Yudoka Azabuki, probably where they shouldn't have, but ultimately they have more hits than misses. I'm taking, I'm trusting them to hit on someone like if Jordan Walsh is there, like you said, and I apologize, I slapped my mic if you heard that. Um, if if Jordan Walsh is there, he's a great, at the least, he's going to become a glue guy. And I think that's a really underestimated, or excuse me, underrated ability of rebuilding teams. They don't have glue guys. They just have kind of guys to do their own thing. But it helps, I think, make young players better when you have a young glue guy to work with and grow with. So I really like that. Um, curious on your thoughts so far on the 2023 draft before we go into games. Yeah, I got one, one more little add on to your thing as, as someone who is a jazz fan. I think Dennis Lindsay gets a bad rap because of the as a bookie pick. Jared Butler hasn't panned out yet. Um, and there were players that were very good available. Everyone talks about Desmond Bain. Jaden McDaniels is who that most of the jazz uh, staff wanted. Um, but his one or two mistakes at the, the last few years have outweighed like the eight or nine great years. So um, of like drafting, like draft evaluation, That's getting fair. Gobert at 27, trading up to get Donovan Mitchell at 13. There's been a lot of hits that have conveyed far more importantly than the misses. It just so happens that the misses may have been what caused this rebuild. Because if you had Jaden McDaniels or Desmond Bain, I think the yeah. team is, has a different trajectory. As for the 2023 draft, I'm, I'm just so eager to see the 2023 class play in college and then watch Scoot and Wen Ben Yama are playing October 4th and October 6th against one another. That'll be must see. Um, they're, they're playing Las Vegas. And I also, I also think I'm going to find a way to watch overtime elite. They're, they're kind of harder to watch um, if, if you have streamlined kind of television. But the Thompson twins are must see. And with the Jazz being a top five possible team and maybe it's very hard to get one or two. I really think that the Thompson twins differentiating them would, would, would be good. So I apologize for not really differentiating their games too much. I could give you little nuances, but those are two guys that I think are polarizing athletes and talents that I, that I think could elevate a franchise. So I'm very eager to watch the kind of the top half, the upper echelon of this draft and where they all play it respectively. Yeah. I don't think it can be overstated just how deep and strong this class is. It has a very, very optimistic early outlook uh, so if you're a jazz fan, this is probably, I mean, jazz Spurs, whoever you're a fan of that's tanking, this is a year to be really invested in college basketball, international ball, the G league, the, I mean, even the OCE, there's a lot out there and shout out to our own Rafael Barlow, who broke the news first uh, on the Victor Wembanyama, Victor Wembanyama versus uh, Scoot Henderson news. That was, that was big time. So I'm going to try and make it out to Vegas. We'll see if I actually can. Um, but that would be really fun to check out. It's going to be a good game. Let's do some games. We're going to do uh, some quick buzzer beaters and stuff. But real quick, let's let a word from our sponsors get in here real fast. All right, Leaf, let's wrap this up. We're going to do some over-unders. We haven't given each other any of the prompts or anything, so this is all going to be blind. Um, mostly, I'm going to be giving to Leaf. Leaf, if you got anything, feel free to hit me on them uh, for a more outsider's perspective. But I'm curious on your thoughts. So let's start with – I'll just start with softballs, make them a little bit harder. Mike Conley traded before or after training camp starts. And I think training camp is only two weeks away. I'll go after. How about Boyan Boydanovich before? Okay. I, I, my theory is that he's the higher yeah. regarded commodity and that some team will pay more. Whereas the Conley will have to kind of, you you'll have to elongate the process because right now what wins in the NBA is size and versatility and the size in the backcourt was one of the greatest deterrents for why the jazz couldn't win despite a yeah. very talented roster. And so that's why when we talk about a guy like uh, the Thompson twins being six, seven, that's, that that's super helpful. And then it's very coveted. Uh, Gigi Jackson's a, a huge, big shouldered freshman who's actually should be a senior in high school. That type of stuff is extremely coveted. And I think the size of Bogdanovich rather than the kind of finesse game of an aging Mike Conley has him as the more valuable com commodity. Yeah, and he and the contract difference. I mean, Boyan's an expiring, Conley being two years, three years left, I think. I think it's two. Um, how about Rudy Gay? Is he gone before training camp? 
I think the Jazz want him gone. I, I don't. I <laughs> yeah, don't I, I know if, so he, if there's a team that'll take him unless you attach him. Um, so I'll say he's probably gone somehow. I I just don't know how that. I think he gets waived. Move. I think he that's, gets waived at the end of training camp. Personally, that's that's, that's but I see that's what I was thinking. But that's but that's after training camp. Yeah. So it's a tough one. So I'll make okay. So this one I think is going to be a little bit harder than all the other ones. Jordan Clarkson traded before. Or excuse me, will he be a member of the Utah Jazz after the trade deadline? Uh, I'll I'll say yes. Yeah, they. I, oh, go ahead. I think I think he's going to be the culture ambassador of the team, and he's kind of going to be. This is how we operate. Uh, I was on the team when we did this, and we were very good. And I think he's the kind of the the holdover culture piece and a, and a good vet to the young guys. I hope so because he was kind of a mess in Cleveland when they were really bad, like Darius Garland's rookie year. He was um, on the court at least pretty rough. He was selfish. And I hope he's learned a lot from those days because, I mean, I think bouncing, he never really won really even in LA. Uh, they weren't exactly a winning team. So maybe that has changed him. And I hope so. I, I ultimately agree though. I think you have to keep a veteran out there. And because of that, I think I think Jordan Clarkson's actually going to be the one that stays this year. So that's that's my prediction. Now let's do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some more. Um, that now it gets a little bit more difficult. Colin Sexton over under 22 and a half points a game. I'll go over. I, wow. I think I think he scored 24 a game, 23.7 in a decent amount of games before injury. I think he's going to have the ball a lot. You got to score points. The the NBA's pace is picked up. I think he scores more. The question I have for Sexton it becomes how how many assists can he be? How valuable can he be as a commodity defensively without impacting winning too highly when the Jazz are trying to lose? And those are fair questions. Um, how about I'm going to double this guy's rookie year stats? Jared Butler over under 17 minutes a game. I'll go under. Um, Dang. Well, that's hard. That's I think I like time. Jared Butler as a prospect, but I watched him and shoot around. I watched him play games. He's got great individual moves, but his passing needs work. He got better as a pick and roll operator, but he his shot never really came along. And there's more mouths to feed in the backcourt. Ochag Baji is a more valuable commodity at this point than Jared Butler. Taylor Horton Tucker is probably the same because they're the same age. Taylor Horton Tucker has been in the NBA for three or four years. Yep. Um, Nikhil Alexander Walker. I still think Nikhil Alexander Walker is good. I, I know there's going to be people that watch the jazz a lot that disagree, but I watch him shoot during warmups. He's a very good shooter. He's long. He can pass. He can be a secondary playmaker. And you got Conley, you've got Clarkson, Malik Beasley, uh, Sexton. I, I just I just think it's a harder one, and I think he's going to be kind of the odd one out because he's not a great athlete, and his feel for the game is spectacular. It's just he hasn't shot well, and at that size, you really got to shoot and finish spectacularly. Yeah, I agree. Let's uh, let's do a couple more player ones, and I'll go to the Jazz as a whole. Yudoka Azubuki has only played 32 games in his career so far uh, at eight minutes a game, so not not that many minutes. Does he clear 15 minutes a game? I mean, the center depth is kind of weak does he get 15 i'll say yes um I, I think at this point the jazz's center room is is really really poor um so i think they're going to try to develop one see if one stands out more than the other as a book, he got better last year he, uh, he occasionally started over white side and games go bear was out and he was <laughs> adequate his endurance is is lacking but 15 should, yeah. shouldn't be too bad but if the Jazz were trying to win, which I, I, I really want to emphasize the word if there, I would start Jared Vanderbilt as my center. It's fair. Uh, how about a quick game of start, cut, or uh, start, bench, or cut? We'll okay. do Jared Vanderbilt, Walker Kessler, Lowry Markinen. And this is kind of long-term, not just for this year. Okay. Um, I'm starting Vanderbilt. And I'm benching Kessler and I'm cutting Markinen, not wow. because of what their current thing is. It's I think Markinen can give you an asset. Markinen, I have I've Markinen. I want to specify this. Markinen is a far better player and a better prospect than Kessler to me. 
But the Jazz, Markkanen's a known commodity. I think he'll be good this year, and the Jazz are going to trade him and try to get more, but he's not a winning player in the Jazz's long-term future. There is a bit of hope for Walker Kessler to be that. So that is why I answer in that order. If it were based off individual ability, it's Markkanen by a landslide, in my opinion. Yeah, one more uh, start bench cut, and then I'll ask you about the team. Um, So let's go to guards. We'll do start bench cut of some of the guards. Let's put in Taylor Horton Tucker. Nikhil Alexander Walker, and let's do I, whoever you think is better of Leandro Balmaro or Jared Butler because you seem pretty low well on Butler now. So, I oh, that this is really hard. <laughs> the uh, the one with the most potential is Taylor Horton Tucker, so I'll I'll keep him there. I I don't love him. Uh, Stylistically, I love Bulmaro's game, but he has to prove he can shoot, and he's barely played at the NBA level. He barely played for the T Wolves last year. But don't forget Nikhil is in there. Yeah, Nikhil. Nikhil's played for a bit. Man, this is hard. Um, <laughs> I'd bench Bulmaro. Yeah, and here, here's why. Wow. Oh, bench. Yeah, I'd bench him. I, I. It's because he's big. It, 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 the modern NBA, he, if you if there's a sliver of a chance he can play similarly, like a fraction of what Joe Ingles was for the Jazz, to, to liken this for Jazz fans, <laughs> he's got that kind of crafty size game where he can pass and be a facilitator. Um, he just needs to work on his jump shot. And I'd, I'd, I'd cut Nikhil and Butler, but I kind of like Nikhil more than, than uh, Bulmaro right now. And yeah. I like I, stylistically, I like him more than Taylor Horton Tucker too. But you can't you can't deny potential and his defensive ability that could happen and his scoring that could happen, especially if he were to gain a jump shot. And what better situation than the Jazz, who are not trying to win, for him to do, uh, to develop and sharpen those skills? Last one, to bring us home. So I don't know what the official number is. You can check that online or something like that for them. But Utah Jazz over under twenty five and a half. I mean, uh, I, I think you should be a handicapper. That feels like a good number. Um, <laughs> I'll go I'll go a sliver over, actually. I, I'd like us to be under, and, and I'd love to get Wenbenyama or Scoop. And that, that's where these sweepstakes lie. I, I feel like those are both generational players. I'll just toss out a comparison. Scoot reminds me of a Memphis Derrick Rose. And for those of you who don't know, that's where Rose played college basketball. He led a Memphis team. It's only one other NBA player on it to the championship and probably should have won. Mario Chalmers hit an enormous shot and Kansas won. Um, that, uh, that said, I think we, we get a little over just because there's a lot of solid players that won't win at a high level. But Markin and Sexton, Vanderbilt, Beasley, Clarkson, all those guys, I, I just have a hard time believing you lose that many games unless the Jazz sit them out. So Yeah, they'll I'll, accidentally I'll go over you. They'll accidentally win a few. Well, uh, these were our over-unders, our outlook for the season predictions, what to look for in the draft for next year long-term as well. Um, Thank you for making Locked On NBA Big Board the first listen of today. Again, if you're not following us on YouTube, please just hit that subscribe button to do wonders for us. Uh, Not to beg like I've been doing all the last few weeks, but it really does mean a lot uh, just for us to climb that Locked On leaderboard internally here. Um, we will be back. Uh, we're almost at five episodes a week. It, they, by the end of the month, by training camp, we're, we're pretty much almost there. Uh, so this is our downtime. Really appreciate you listening through and through. means a ton. We will be back. Have a wonderful rest of your day.